Uh, well, Dr. Ehrman, I want to thank you so much for writing a helpful resource to help us better understand the concepts of heaven and hell and how those ideas uh, developed in ancient cultures and then how those concepts were influential in, in Christian thinking. And I'm curious about what led to you to write this book. I've long been interested in the afterlife, as I suppose <laughs> most people are in one way or another, uh, and um, for the for the usual reasons in my case, uh, having grown up a, a conservative uh, Christian, I was interested in the questions of heaven and hell. Um, as a scholar, I got interested in a kind of uh, genre that people don't know very much about, uh, which is a, uh, it's a kind of writing from the ancient world that describes people who are given guided tours of heaven and hell. They, they actually go down to see what the realms of the dead are like. And um, we, we get a number of these in, uh, in Greek and uh, Roman traditions. You have one, a description, a full book of the Odyssey of Homer, and uh, Virgil's Aeneid has one. There, there are a whole bunch of ones in Greek and Roman sources and in Jewish sources. But I got interested in the Christian ones in particular because these early Christian ones are forerunners of Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, and it's interesting to see how they, how they worked uh, in the earlier times. And so my book deals with, uh, uh, my, deal, my book deals with the ones in the early centuries, starting with one that's called the Apocalypse of Peter, that almost made it into the New Testament. It was, it was, uh, there were people who thought it belonged in the New Testament for several centuries and uh, on up then through the fifth, uh, fifth Christian century, these various accounts of uh, Christians being shown what the realms of the dead were like. Yeah, I remember uh, in school, I was an English lit major and I remember studying Odyssey and Virgil and then Dante's Inferno. And there seemed to be this theme about the hero descending into the underworld for a certain period of time yeah. and then coming back. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the apocalypse of Peter. What is, the, I've never read that. I don't know anything about it. What, what did you learn by reading that story? Well, it's a great, it's a really, it's a great book. And it's, um, you know, it, the, the technical term, what's when scholars talk about this phenomenon, of course, scholars use terms that, you know, people don't normally use, but the term for this phenomenon of going down, coming back is called, is catabasis. And so this is a catabasis tradition. Catabasis literally just mean in Greek, it means going down. Um, and it, the Apocalypse of Peter is the first one we have of this in the surviving Christian tradition it's a book that we knew about for centuries and centuries, because as I said, it almost made it into the New Testament, but we didn't have a copy of it. Uh, it when it didn't get included, nobody bothered to copy it, and so it got lost. And it wasn't discovered until the 1880s. There was a French archaeological team in 1886 that was digging in a uh, cemetery in Akmim, Egypt, and they uncovered a tomb with a person buried there with a 66 page book and included in this book is this apocalypse of peter um and it's fascinating because it's an account of um of peter uh, peter and the disciples it begins with them talking to jesus and jesus described what's going to happen at the end of the world and uh peter wants to know well you know what's it like after death <laughs> and jesus shows him uh, what it's like, and he takes him to uh, both the realms of the dead, the, the realms of the damned, and the realms of the blessed. Um, and it's a fascinating account because the um, the realms of the damned are described in uh, gory uh, detail, <laughs> wow. and there are there are different compartments of hell. And Peter visits these and sees how people are being punished depending on what their sin was, their characteristic sin. And so it starts out by describing sinners who were um, who were blasphemers against God, and they're mm. punished by being hanged by their tongues over eternal flames because they blasphemed with their tongue. And then, uh, then, then he sees these w women who had plaited their hair, braided their hair to make themselves attractive so they could seduce men. They're hanged by their hair over eternal flames. Wow, wow. <laughs> the men they seduced are hanged by a different body part <laughs> over eternal flames. And it kind of goes on like that uh, for a long time. But then he finally gets to the realms of the blessed, and he sa doesn't say much about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, what can you say? They're eternally happy. It smells good. It's nice weather. <laughs> it's great. You know, but, but the, he focuses on hell. And the whole point of this is, look, if you want to go to one place, not the other, you better behave. Yeah, that is that is super interesting. Do they know anything about the writer of this text? 
Um, so the, um, of course, the, the text claims to be written by Peter, the disciple, Peter, which is not right. Uh, we can date the text. It's usually dated to the 130s or so, or sometime oh. around there. And so it would have been, you know, 60 or 70 years after Peter had died. Um, and there are, debate, there are debates about the text. And in my book, I have to talk about what we can say about the text and the various manuscripts that we now have, because we found other forms of it. Uh, than, than first. And um, we don't know who actually wrote the book. Um, all we can say is some kind of rough things about him. He was obviously, he was a Greek speaking Christian who was, uh, you know, outside of Israel. And he was, uh, you know, he'd been influenced by various kinds of um, Greek and Roman traditions about this going down, going up thing. And he's, he's trying, to, trying to portray a vision of heaven and hell that in fact is quite different from what you get in the New Testament. Um, and the irony is that most people today would agree with the portrayal in the Apocalypse of Peter, even though it's not part of their Bible, because people think that you die and your soul goes to be rewarded or to be tortured. And the gospel, the Apocalypse of Peter is the first place we actually get that. You don't get that in the, in the earlier Christian literature. So as you started to like look at these ancient texts, um, how did you just, how did you kind of like, uh, I guess your process for reading them? Because I, I know like me, you know, being a, a modern reader, when I look at something, when I read like the words heaven and hell, I go to my own fuzzy thinking on those, on those subjects. But, that, but I'm not thinking the way that the writer of these ancient texts are thinking about heaven yeah. and hell. So as you're kind of like, reading these older texts, how are you making sense of what they're saying about these places? Yeah. The main thing, that, the, the difficult thing for, uh, I think, most readers today is to realize that, um, that our assumptions and our views of the world and, uh, and even the words we use are not what people used in other times and places. And so what the historian has to do is understand uh, terms and concepts uh, and ideas and beliefs in light of their own context, which means you, someone like like me, we, we spend a lot of our time studying ancient texts to understand the ancient world better so that when we take any particular text, we can put it in its context. Because if you, if you take it out of its own context, you, if you change the context of something, you, you change what it means. And so it, it's interesting that just to use the word hell, for example, the word hell never actually, our, our concept of hell never occurs uh, in the Old Testament. And it's, it's no, never anything that Jesus himself ever talked about. Um, in, the, in English translations of the New Testament, you'll get the word hell. Um, uh, and that, that's become a traditional uh, way of translating some of the things Jesus said. But Jesus himself never uses, they, they didn't have a word for that. That Well, they did. They would call it Tartarus <laughs> in Greek. Tartarus is a place of torment. But even in Greek, most people didn't go to Tartarus. Most people went to Hades, which was not a place of torment. Uh, but Jesus doesn't use either word. Jesus uses the word Gehenna. And it turns out that's not even a, in the, it's in the Greek New Testament, but he wasn't speaking Greek, and it's not a Greek word. Gehenna refers to oh, a valley outside of Jerusalem that was thought to be a completely God-forsaken, dese desecrated place. And Jesus threatens people that if they if they uh, if they sin against God and don't repent, they're going to be thrown into Gehenna. Well, English trans into this pit outside of Jerusalem. This is like they're not going to get a decent burial. They're going to be in this desecrated place. It's going to be like, oh God, you don't want that to happen to your corpse. Um, but when English translators, you know, they they weren't going to use the word Gehenna because nobody knows what that means. And so they thought, well, okay, it means hell. And so they translated it as hell. But then when an English reader reads that. There, Jesus is saying you're going to be cast into hell, and you, oh my God, you know, because you're going to be tortured forever. And He's not talking about being tortured forever, but you only know that if you, you know, if you put it in its own yeah. context instead of thinking that it's like in our modern context. That's so helpful, and and I think that's the struggle that a lot of us have when we read the Bible is that there are these terms, these concepts that they're they're foreign to us, and especially if we're reading an English translation, and like I would. When you read the word hell, that's the imagery we, yeah. we get. Um, that's our understanding of it. So what advice do you have for, the, for those of us who take the Bible seriously, that want to study it critically? 
um, when we approach these concepts? Well, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of scholars in the world who uh, who spend their lives doing this. They, they committed their lives to understanding the Bible and understanding it in its own context. And a number of these people try to write books for for general audiences. And so I write the the book I've just written on the journeys to heaven and hell. Um, is uh, it's an academic book. Non-scholars would be able to handle most of it, and it'd be, but but uh, it's really written more for scholars. I have another book on he just called Heaven and Hell, uh, which is written for lay people that explains all of this kind of stuff. And so I suggest that they read uh, read writings by people who are bona fide scholars. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of books written about Jesus and about the Bible by evangelists and pastors and, and theologians. And I, I've got, I don't have a problem with that at all. But if you want to understand the historical, what's really going on historically, you need to read what a historian says. And another thing I'll point out uh, for people who don't, don't know me in my work, I have a blog that deals with this kind of thing all the time. <laughs> I post five times a week, every, every week for the last 10 years. And my, I've got the archives for the whole thing that deals with everything having to do with the historical study of, especially the New Testament and Jesus and early Christianity, but also the Old Testament and related topics. As, as you were studying how the ancient world understood heaven and hell and how those ideas evolved, um, and then you're looking at the, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, uh, can you talk about some of the similarities you've seen uh, from these ancient ideas being incorporated into these biblical texts? It's a complicated stud story, um, and it's pretty much what my book, my, my book for a general audience, it's Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife. Uh, that's, I actually sketched the, that whole relationship between the biblical views and non-biblical non views. Um, the Bible is pretty interesting because the Old Testament, virtually the entire Old Testament teaches that when a person dies, that's the end of the story. Um, there's, no, there's no afterlife. You don't go somewhere. Um, and it's because in Jewish thinking, uh, traditional Jewish thinking did not understand that you have a soul within you that can be separated from your body. The body dies, but the soul lives on. That's a view that was developed principally in our culture in Greek settings, in Greek philosophical circles. In Greek, that's what you know pagans thought. Uh, but Jews thought that the body and the soul were an integrated whole. And the, um, they can't exist independently of one another. And so it's not just that your body dies, your spirit doesn't do any, goes away too. And so the way to think of it is that it's, ancient Hebrews thought about the, uh, the, your spirit or your soul as your breath. The same word in, in many of these ancient languages, Hebrew and Greek, the breath and spirit are the same word. And the idea is that when God created Adam, right, Adam and Eve, he creates Adam in Genesis chapter 2. He just makes this lump of dirt on the ground. It's in a human shape, but it's just a lump of dirt. But he breathes into it. When he breathes into it, it becomes a living being. And so if we think about it like that, that a, be, a, live, a human is the integration of, of, of spirit and body, then it makes sense. Because when you, when you stop breathing, you, know, you don't think your breath goes anywhere. <laughs> you just stop breathing. Uh, You're yeah, dead right. now. And that's what, that's what ancient Hebrews thought. You died and your soul, you know, and so you, your soul didn't exist. It just, you know, it's like your, it's your breath. It went away. What ended up happening is that in Jewish circles, they're started, they started thinking uh, that there's got to be something more than this, <laughs> than this life, you know, because you get people who are really righteous and God-fearing people who die. They have a crummy life, horrible life. They die, and that's the end of the story. Doesn't God, like, help them out when they're dead? And, and you have these schmucks over here who are rich and famous and powerful, and they die and they get away with it. Like, that can't be right. And so Jews ended up developing this idea that there is a life after death. But since they were Jews and thought that the body and soul were an integrated whole, the way a person is uh, has an afterlife is if the, when the soul comes back into the body at the end of time and there's a resurrection of the dead. The dead are brought back to life, their body, and they live forever in their bodies then. And so they, so there were Jews who came to think that at the end of time, God would, uh, there'd be a judgment day and everybody would be raised up and the sinners would be destroyed and the righteous would be given eternal life here on earth, paradise here on earth. And so that's, that's, that's what Jesus thought. And that's what, that's what Paul thought. And then later Christians then, just quickly, later Christians 
who were not raised in Jewish circles, but mainly came from Gentile circles, had Greek philosophical ideas in mind from like Plato and things like that, where, where the body and the soul separate and the soul lives forever, the body dies. They brought that into Christianity and they combined it with Jesus' teaching of the resurrection of the dead and they came up with the idea of heaven. that You, you die and your soul goes to heaven <laughs> and to be rewarded. So it's a combination of Plato and Jesus, oddly enough. I'm curious about like some of the contradictions or discrepancies you found in the Bible in relation to these ideas of heaven and hell. Because I'm thinking about um, that part where uh, Jesus is on the cross and he tells the thief, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then you have Jesus saying in one of the gospel accounts that he gives his spirit yeah. up to God. And then you have other stories of Jesus descending into uh -huh. the underworld, uh, similar to these Odysseus stories of the hero going to the underworld and yeah. coming back. And so we're left with this weird discrepancy of where does he go? And I'm kind of curious about as you kind yeah. of explored uh, the Bible and looking for discrepancies, I'm, I'm curious about the ones specifically around heaven and hell. Yeah, yeah. Found really interesting. Yeah, well, that you know, um, I, I had to deal with that in my in my popular book on heaven and hell because, uh, as I said in the Old Testament, there's no there's no life after death at all. Even even this place called Sheol, uh, people tend to think of that as kind of like a Greek Hades that you like all the mm -hmm. souls go down there and live for a while. And I argue in my book, it probably doesn't mean that. It probably Sheol is always. The synonym for Sheol in the Old Testament, the synonyms are death and grave and tomb. And it looks like Sheol is just a way of talking about the tomb you end up in. When you get to, to the New Testament, when you get to Jesus, it's not that. It's that, that there's going to be an afterlife. Your, body, your spirit's going to come back in your body and you're going to live forever. In the later, in later writings of the New Testament, including the Gospel of Luke, the one you're referring to. Luke is living later. Luke is not a Jew. Luke Luke seems to think that there's a separation of the body and the soul, and the soul lives on. And so he reports Jesus saying to the thief on the cross, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, and that, that pretty clearly says that the, they're going to die and their souls are going to go up there, which is con... So that's, that's what Jesus says in Luke. But Luke is writing, you know, 50 years after Jesus himself, and he's incorporating a view that Jesus didn't have, which happens a lot in the Gospels. Uh, and so, so you, you get that. In the New Testament, you get hints of this idea that at Jesus' death, he went down to Hades, to the place of the dead. You get hints of that in a couple of places, especially in the book of 1 Peter, chapters 3 and 4. Eventually, that led to this whole question of this whole doctrine some of your listeners may have heard of called the harrowing of hell <laughs> harrowing of hell was this medieval tradition that that tried to explain what happened between jesus death and his resurrection like he dies he comes back to life on sunday he dies on friday comes back to, what's he doing in the meantime <laughs> like he did not exist or did he what what happened and the idea was well if his death brought about salvation he probably went down to preach to those who had died already about his salvation because, you know, it wouldn't be fair if they died before salvation was available. And surely he made it available to them, too. And so the idea is that he went down then and preached to them so those who would believe in him could be saved. And that developed into this entire tradition wow. uh, and their stories that started circulating. And so in, in this book, this book that I've just written that came out, the, the, the Journeys to Heaven and Hell book, I have an entire chapter devoted to this whole uh, idea and how it developed over time from these hints in the New Testament to full-fledged narratives uh, in a later gospel nobody's heard of called the Gospel of Nicodemus, where Jesus actually it describes him going down to hell and getting everyone out of there. <laughs> really, oh. really interesting. Uh, and in part, it's interesting because uh, parts of that tradition suggest that Jesus Jesus was so powerful that death could not prevent him from doing what he wanted to do. Hell could not prevent him from doing what he wanted to do. The devil, nobody could prevent him. So he took everybody out, <laughs> even the sinners. And so, like, you know, why not? So it's universal salvation in some of these some of these texts. It's great. <laughs> uh, can you talk about the idea uh, that's uh, also popular around annihilation that, uh, that we see also in Christian thinking? Yeah. Um, so annihilation is the idea that there's not punishment after death but that some people or all people are simply annihilated. They no longer exist. Um, 
I, um, I came after intense study for several years, I came, came to realize that this is what Jesus himself thought. Um, Jesus, uh, uh, and other Jews of his day did not believe in, uh, that God would torture people after death or have them tortured or, or allow them to be tortured. The punishment was death. And it's interesting. You actually, you can see this in the gospels of the new Testament. Um, when Jesus talks about those who will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, so there'll be, it's called the kingdom of heaven, not because you're living with God up above, but it's because heaven has come to earth. You have a kingdom here on earth that's like a heavenly kingdom because it's like to live, it's a paradise. So um, it's here on earth, just just like God made the paradise. Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden. We're getting back there, and it's going to be down here on earth. What about the people who aren't worthy to go there, who are sinners or who are the schmucks who got away with it? Jesus, um, Jesus teaches that they will be destroyed. His term is destruction. Uh, he never talks about them being tormented. He talks about them being destroyed, and often it's by being being destroyed by throw, being thrown into fire, and so they're like mm. they're burned. But you know, when, when something is thrown into a fire, like, Jesus likens it to weeds that get thrown into the fire. That's what it'll be at the end of time. People will be raised and be mm. thrown into the fire. Well, what happens to the weeds? They're they're not in there still a thousand years later. The fire burns them up. They're dead, <laughs> and that's what happens to the people too. It's an unpleasant death. But it's it's annihilation, and then they just don't exist anymore. And I think Paul Paul also thought that. I think this is the teach, and the Book of Revelation teaches this. I think it's all. I think this is the biblical view that people get annihilated, uh, and so which is kind of a good thing because otherwise, you'd have to say that that the God of the New Testament believes in torturing people for trillions of years, with that being just the beginning for sins they committed for twenty. Really. Uh, sounds sounds pretty bad. Sounds, not really uh, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, are there uh, any early Christian uh, theologians that uh, did talk about this? Because I feel like this idea of annihilation is not really taught in a lot of churches. Um, yeah, there, there, there are. I mean, there, there are. There's a, there's a very wide range of belief about the afterlife in the church fathers after. Uh, after the New Testament. Some, of course, continue to think that, you know, you die and that's the end of the story. What ends up happening principally is that there there's a great utility in thinking that if you uh, if if your option is eternal bliss or eternal torture, <laughs> that you're more likely to go for the bliss. Uh, and so uh, church fathers began in the second and third centuries, began to emphasize very much that there's a conscious, conscious torment in hell forever. And they use this as an evangelistic tool. Um, some of the some of these accounts that I talk about in my book on the journeys to heaven and hell describe how uh, you, you have these accounts in early Christianity, second, third centuries and following of people who go to hell and come back and tell the story. And they do this in these accounts in order to convince people to convert. Mm. And once people hear that, man, they convert in droves. <laughs> and so this became a standard trope within the uh, Christian theological tradition that um, the conscious torment will last forever unless you repent. Mm. So you better repent. Um, the, uh, the main exceptions to that in early Christianity were not annihilists. They were universalists. They were the ones who said that, look, God is so sovereign he's he is lord of all and nothing can resist him even evil and so in the long run even even the mm. evil will, will repent one way or another and so universalism became the the it was still on the margins but it was it was a bigger margin than the uh, annihilationists yeah you mentioned these like frightening and scary stories of what it's like in hell which then helps people like convert over to christianity um and, and earlier you mentioned the Apocalypse of Peter document. Are there other like documents like that that you've studied? Yeah, yeah my, my book Journeys to Heaven and Hell is all about those kinds of documents. And so I uh, so there's the so there's the, the Apocalypse of, of Peter. So the Apocalypse of Peter ended up, as I said, not getting into the New Testament, and it fell into disfavor because it looks like the earliest 
version of it. So these these things they go through many versions as people copy them and add stories to them, take away stories because they're you know they're storytelling and so they're they're expanding. The earliest version indicates that everybody gets saved, and in the fourth mm. century. Christians were like coming out w way against that, and they didn't. They, and so, so they didn't. Co they didn't like the gospel, the apocalypse of Peter anymore, which is why I got lost. But it served as a as a source for a book called the Apocalypse of Paul. <laughs> the Apocalypse of Paul is is a much ex it's much expanded, and there's lots of differences in it from the Apocalypse of Peter. But it's a similar conceit that Paul is taken to the realms of the blessed and the realms of the damned, and he see. He, contrasts uh, the two. This was very popular through the Middle Ages, the Apocalypse of Paul, and it was known to Dante. Uh, this, is where, uh, mm. this was one of Dante's sources for his idea uh, for the comedy mm. is that, that he would, you know, that he, of course he has purgatory, which didn't come into the Christian tradition until much later than uh, these apocryphal texts that I've studied. So, so I talk about things like the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Paul, the Acts of Thomas, the, uh, uh, you know, so there's, there's the, the Gospel of Nicodemus. There's, I've, said, I've got a range of texts that many people haven't heard of, uh, but they're fascinating texts, and some of them were quite uh, influential on Christian theology throughout the centuries. When did you, when did you start seeing concepts of purgatory? So uh, one of the things I explain in my uh, my general book on heaven and hell for the for the broad audience is where purgatory came from. Um, the standard uh, explanation in scholarly circles is that it's very late development. That, it, that the the word purgatory itself doesn't actually show up until the 1100s. And it doesn't become a doctrine mm. until about a century after that. The idea of purgatory, some a lot of people have mistaken understandings about what it is, including uh, a number of my Catholic friends have never really understood what it is. So what it is officially is purgatory is a place for temporary punishment for those who are eventually going to go to heaven. They're, they're not righteous enough yet. They still have to have some of their sins burned away. And so they um, so they have to go through this. Step. So it's not for people who are going to hell. People who are going to hell are just going to hell. But people who are en route to heaven, if they're not already saints, they've got to have some punishment. And, you know, if they're not, you know, more punishment, <laughs> depending on how many bad things you've done. And so uh, so that's incentive, you know. So so that that becomes the doctrine in the 12th century. Um the uh, what I show in my book is that there are earlier antecedents for that. You actually get antecedents for that in pagan literature, because like uh, Virgil, for example, in the Aeneid has uh, shows that people go through this kind of process of having their clean their sins cleansed for a thousand mm. years, and Plato has something like that. You start finding it in Christianity already at the end of the second century, where you have instances of, uh, you have stories. These are all stories, of course. They're stories of people who are very saintly, who can pray for somebody who's being punished to be removed from their punishment. And so it ends up being a temporary mm -hmm. punishment. And in some senses, that's the beginning of, of the idea of purgatory, that um, some people will be punished initially, but then will end up being uh, being saved is that i might be totally wrong on this um that parable about abraham's bosom i get this is the place where maybe jesus descends into is that would be that like a purgatory is that not right no so yeah so that's a complicated that's another luke thing in in, in the god in the gospel of luke the gospel of luke talks about um there's this parable the rich man and lazarus and rich, there's this rich guy who's like filthy rich, like eats sumptuous meals, dressed. He's like a king. He's got all these slaves, all these servants and all these wives and stuff going on. He's like this. And there's a guy outside at his gate starving to death named Lazarus, who's so like just starving to death. And he's so sick. He's got wounds all over his body. And the dogs come up and lick his, his wounds. It's like, oh, guys, they both die. And Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. That's up above. So that's a good place. Abraham is, a, is the forefather of the chosen people, the Jews. And so being at his bosom means that he's eating at a banquet up there. And the rich man is sent down to be punished in, in the fires, fire, fires of torment. And so that's where the – and so – uh, yeah, so I, I have to talk about that in my book because, you know, when I said that you don't have hell in the New Testament, this is a place that looks like you got hell <laughs> uh, because this man's down there in the flames. And so I have to explain why this is, it certainly is in Luke, but it's not something that Jesus taught. This is a later addition to Jesus' 
teachings. I, I show why scholars think that. When you look at like uh, the ancient world, and I'm, I'm curious, like, are there like drawings of like how they perceive like a flat Earth with like a heaven over the Earth and like a hell under the Earth? Are those? I'm just kind of curious, like how they perceive like where these places were. Yeah, it's interesting because you know there were different perceptions in the ancient world. the The idea that most people have that everybody thought the world was flat, you know, until like modern times, uh, that's a complete myth. It's not true. Uh, in the ancient world, they knew many many people knew it was round. People like Aristotle calculated mm. how what what it was, and they knew it was an orb. Um, but there were people who had other ideas, and in traditional Jewish thinking, as in the Old Testament, it's more like you're describing. You've got the, you've got where we are here, and yeah. you've got a world above, and you've got a kind of a world below. And you get this actually in the book of Genesis when God creates the heavens and the earth. In Genesis, it says that He creates the heavens and the earth, and it doesn't say that He created water. The water's there. God, what God does is He puts a firmament in the water, a firm spot in the water that separates the water above from the waters below. And so there's this firm place. And in that understanding, the, re the rain is what seeps down from the firmament above, and the rivers and the springs and the oceans come from the water down below, because you got water above and water below. And so that's, and so, um, and then the idea is that God is, God is up there above the waters, and below, the water below, is the realm of the dead. Uh, it, for, for, for people who have a three-storied universe. Mm. And so the dead go down, you bury them. They go, you know, they're in the grave. So they're down below. God's up above. And so that's, the, that's why people think of, you know, people going to heaven means like you go up. You know, which uh, the idea of going up to heaven makes sense if you've got that kind of three-dimensional universe. It doesn't make any sense in our universe. Uh, because there's no up. <laughs> you know, up is, you know, wherever you right, have to be right. and, and there's not, you know, you can't. But in the Bible, you could actually get there. I mean, you could, you could, you know, you can build a Tower of Babel and get pretty close to where God is. And so, you know, God can't have you getting up there. And when G Elijah goes up to heaven, and Jesus ascends up to heaven. It's right, like, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So the Tower of Babel story, uh, they're trying to build a a building to get up into heaven looks like it yeah because god god has to confuse their languages because uh you know they, and so uh yeah yeah you, you can't get a lot of genesis is about genesis is about the separation of the divine realm from the human realm mm. and part of the problem with adam and eve eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is it made them like god because they now they know right and wrong inherently uh, and so that's like God. And so that's why they get punished. Tower of Babel, they're getting close. That's why they get punished. And uh, yeah, so you, you got you got to mind your place in the universe. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, well, Dr. Ermel, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, before we go, um, any advice for those of us who want to be better critical readers of our Bible? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, you know, I think the I think the biggest discovery that scholars have made uh, since the Enlightenment about the Bible. With the Enlightenment, there came changes in every field of study, of course, including biblical studies. And the biggest, the biggest discovery was actually not discovery of manuscripts or discover, archaeological discoveries. The biggest discovery of uh, scholars in the last two, three hundred years has been that the Bible is not a single book. We think of it as a book written by an author. You buy it; it's between two covers. And it's like you got different chapters, but it's like it's it's a book. And what scholars realize, it's not a book. It's it's there are sixty six books in the Protestant New Testament, and uh, many different authors living at many different times in many different contexts, different circumstances, different historical situations. And if you want to read what an author says, you you really need to put that author in his or her own context. Because if somebody's writing in the 12th century, they mean something different by using the same terms we might use today in the 21st century. Uh, and so, um, and so, let alone you know, 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. So you really have to know their context. So you have to treat each book separately and not pretend, for example, when you're reading the Gospels, you should not pretend that Mark is saying the same thing as John is. 
Yeah, they're both gospels, but these are two different authors living in different times and places, and they've got different points of view. And if you don't, if you don't just let Mark be Mark, if you read Mark and say, oh, he means this, something that John is saying, then you're interpreting Mark by somebody else he didn't mm -hmm. even know. And you, like, if you don't, people don't, you don't want to do that. I mean, if you write a book, you don't want somebody to read your book and say, oh, oh, she must mean what, you know, this other person meant. Right. Oh, that's not necessarily the case. You got to read what this person said. So that's the biggest thing, I think, is to recognize these are all different books by different authors. And you need to, you need to read them, not pretending they're all saying the same thing. Um, so, and the other thing, as I said, I think it really helps uh, to guide you in that to listen to what you know professional scholars have, have said who've devoted their lives to this kind of thing. I, I've got many friends who've who've spent 50 years of their lives hmm. since they, I mean, who learned Greek and Hebrew and Latin and Aramaic and Coptic, and they know all these ancient languages and they they study is what they do for a living. And so it's not they're always right. <laughs> Sometimes they're wrong, but at least you know you, there are people who are experts. Uh, and it, it, it's helpful to listen to what experts have to say, whether you want to believe them or not. <laughs> uh, for those of us with, with limited time and limited budgets, because um, some of these resources are very expensive to get great commentaries, academic commentaries. Do you have yeah. recommendations on like uh, kind of a, a way to go that's not super expensive to help us like, yeah. like critically read and, and get accurate commentaries? Yeah. I think the best thing to do is to start by getting a really good annotated Bible. Um, and there's two that I would recommend. There are all sorts of study Bibles out there. Uh, most of them I do not recommend uh, because most of them are, they're fine for what they are, for what they are. But if you want to know historical information by experts, then you need a really good solid study Bible. And the two that I like the best are the Harper Collins Study Bible which has, uh, before each book, it has a little introduction to what the book's about, and explains when it was written, and by whom, and what its main themes are. And then it, it has little comments at the bottom of each page explaining difficult, difficult verses. Uh, the other, so that's the HarperCollins Study Bible. And the other is the Oxford Annotated Bible. The Oxford, the new Oxford Annotated Bible. These are both done by serious, serious scholars. Uh, who have devoted their lives to this kind of thing. And they just provide such helpful information and charts and maps and things. It, it's it's the best way to start, I think. And when you're looking at other commentaries, are there any like red flags? Like, okay, that's probably not a commentary I probably want to get into from an academic standpoint. Um, well, I would say most commentaries are like that. For, for okay. <laughs> um, I think the thing that one has to do is is pay attention to who's writing it. Um, and so um, the, the, the two commentary series that scholars tend to use the most would be the Anchor Bible series and the Hermeneia series. But some lay people might find those a little bit uh, uh, difficult. And so I think what you want is one that is not just um, uh, talking about the religious relevance of the material. That for most people, of course, is very important. But, but if you want to understand these doctrines, really understand them, you need to approach them from a historical and a literary perspective. And for that, you need scholars who are trained in history and literature. Uh, and so there's not a particular series per se that I would recommend. There are several one volume Bible commentaries, though, that are helpful, including a Harper Collins. Uh, Bible commentary or a Jerome Bible commentary. There, there are some one volume commentaries that can be very helpful. But thank, uh, that's super helpful. Well, um, Dr. Ehrman, I want to thank you so much for, for being on the podcast, for sharing your insights on heaven and hell and the way ancient thinkers thought about these concepts and how those ideas came into the Christian tradition. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I just want, I want to say to everyone again that if they're interested in this kind of material, my, my blog is just called the Bart Ehrman Blog. And uh, so just check it out. But thanks. I really enjoyed this. This is a very great question. I've enjoyed talking about all of this. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video clip from the Delgado podcast. To get more videos just like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. Take care.